some religions that do a baptism, water baptism for a baby. Uh, let's put it this way. The Bible says you have to reach an age of accountability. So your age of accountability, for some of you, you're 50, 60 years old. You still never reach because you're still immature. But we're working on you. Amen. But the parents here, they bring the babies and they desire to raise them up in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. So what they, we do as a church is we bless the babies uh, or children. I heard one baby screaming out there. Anyway. Oh, that was an adult. Okay. <laughs> So we as a church family, we help raise the kids. Amen. So if somebody like pull your kids' ear, okay. it's good. <laughs> Amen. As long as they don't pull the ear off. You okay. So we as a family, and you know, the world says it takes a village to raise a child. But it takes a church to raise a child. And we as a church family, uh, I, take my, I take my responsibilities as a spiritual father very seriously. I pray for all of you every day. Not all of you are going to cross my path every day because you're doing good. Some of you cross my path more than one time a day. Some of you never, ever leave my path. So if I'm limping, you know why. Because I'm on my knees for you. But today I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Denise, and somebody, uh, some of you who feel uh, a calling to surround this family to come up. Uh, it's not easy raising a child. They say it takes over $250,000 to raise a child from birth to 18. And in Pastor Denise and Pastor Jeff's case, it took $12 million to raise his son. 29, he's still there in the house. <laughs> I don't think he's leaving. <laughs> I know. If you get food, right? As long as you get rice in the pot, they're going to keep coming home. All right. So I'm going to ask each of them to do a blessing. Over the three, this is Josiah, by the way, and this is, what's your name? Nah, Melanie, <laughs> and this is Roman. So he lives up to his name. He's always roaming around here. Okay. Quite quickly, I might add. So I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jeff to pronounce a blessing over them, and Pastor Den Denise, and uh, yeah, you got a mic there. Go ahead. <laughs> Smart guy. <laughs> Father, we just come to you and we thank you so much for this family, Lord God, and these precious little ones. Thank you even this morning that you showed us how precious they are in your sight, God, and that you sent your son just as you're sending these into the world. Father, I'm reminded that we are in a generation that is in desperate need of all that you have. Lord, I pray that these would be world changers right here, that, God, they would grow to love you like no other. And, God, that they would begin to pour out their fruit on other children and others that come into their sphere of influence, Lord God. And they would just affect this generation that they're in. Father, we ask you for protection over them, that you would set a wall of fire around them and that your glory would begin to just pour out from within. Thank you for the worshiping heart, Lord God. I pray for a release in worship even more so, God. Thank you, what a blessing he is. Thank you for this princess heart, God, that she knows who she is in you and that she will live that life that says, I am a king's daughter. I lack no thing. I don't need to live up to anybody else's potential except my Savior's. And, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Josiah, Lord God, that he was named perfectly. You chose his name before the foundations of the earth to make a difference in life. And we commit to that. We will help grow and bless and change and scold when necessary in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for this family, Lord, and uh, for the uh, mother and father, Lord, that you have brought them forth to come to know you. And through that, they have been more than abundant with three children. I remember when there were none. And, uh, <laughs> and now there's three. So we thank you, Lord, for them, Lord. Your word, Lord, says that ch children are like arrows in the quiver of a warrior. And, Lord, let these arrows go out and seek the target that you have put 
before them, Lord. Lord, that you would guide them, protect them, and make their paths clear before them, Lord, as they go out to do your will and your favor, Lord. And we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. All right, why don't you all stand? There's some of you that have never been dedicated nor water baptized, so we're going to do this as well. So I want you all to embrace each other, grab each other's hand. Uh, Some of you have been water baptized, and we're looking for cleaner water for you. Hallelujah. Because you got to get cleansed every day, amen. Everybody got to do that. All right. Now, as this family is all joined together, we pronounce a blessing over all of you, including these three children and the parents. Lord, we bless the parents, Lord. They have a, quite a monumental task. Uh, prayerfully, it's not mental. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all those out here that never got baptized as a, as a baby. Uh, maybe they're an adult. We dedicate them to you as well. We pronounce a blessing over all this family. Every person, every joint supplies, the word says. That's the truth, Lord. Every person here is important to your kingdom. And you always group people together who are just like each other. So that means we are a very aggravated bunch. (laughs) So we thank you, Lord, that we cannot just aggravate each other. We can be an anointing for each other and lubricate the wheels, Lord, so that we all work together in harmony and unity. And we thank you, Lord, that we pronounce a blessing over every person here simply because... If one of us is suffering, we're all suffering. So we thank you that the atmosphere was set today in worship, and we just thank you that every person here can be a worshiper every day of their life, Lord. We lift you up high, Lord, and we thank you. Not only do we lift you up, you give us the ability to come and be lifted up with you and seated in you in heavenly places. So we, right now we apply the blood of Jesus to every person here, from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. There is no enemy that can cross the blo- the, that bloodline, Lord. So at the very best, he is so far beneath us, Lord, that we don't give him any credits. And we thank you for this family of God that you have so quickly uh, equipped, Lord, to join together. And we thank you, Lord, that we can forge forward and there is no enemy that can stop us. So, Lord, we are blessed and more than blessed. And we just thank you. Your word says that, Uh, Our gift will make room for us. So we come as a family and we we be together with all of our gifts in full display and operation, including these three children, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that whatever their gifts may be, they were already pre-installed. It says in the word that you knew us even before we were in our mother's womb. So we thank you, Lord, that this womb, this church can be a place of great birth, Lord. And we can all launch out and do great and mighty things and great exploits for you, Lord. We love you with all our heart. And we thank you for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand. Go on. If you're not offended that I, I didn't do my job because I need to push you in a direction. Amen. We need to steer the ship in the right way. So as they blow this up, calling this humble or grumble. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you are grumblers by nature? Hallelujah. Well, the good part is you're supernatural, not just natural. You're supernatural, so you shouldn't be grumbling. You should be humbling. Hallelujah. And then we'll point out some things in the Word. Now, good for you. Amen. Uh, Last week I was on Oahu. A lot of good fruit came out of that. Uh, On my way here, I got a testimony that... uh, some lady that I don't even remember praying for. She had a brain tumor and it disappeared. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. How do you even explain these things? She said it was the size of a golf ball and inoperable. They were already pronouncing death over her and the thing disappeared. She was getting these headaches and her vision was getting blurry and all of this. And then she just woke up the next day after I prayed and her vision wasn't perfect. No headache. So she went to the doctor and had it checked out, and the tumor disappeared. That's good news, you know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For some of you, you think you have a tumor. That's your brain. Okay, let's not have that disappear. Okay. No tumors in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So keep me in prayer. I'm going through my own battles. Amen. So I'm going to get there. Amen. Here, there, or in the air, they say. Hopefully here. Amen. All right. So today, humble or grumble? Well, we all have reason to grumble, right? Some of you look in the mirror in the morning, you're already upset. You just set the tone for your face. Amen. You ladies have an added weapon called makeup. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> they say you got to paint the barn door, right? Amen. Hopefully you don't have to cover your barn. It's that big. Amen. You can, uh... <laughs> so as you read through this thing, you know, it should help you. You know, I've been doing a lot of counseling in Hilo ever since I got back from Oahu. Uh, the good part is counseling is good, but only as good as you use the advice that's given to you. There's a lot of people, and the word that's been coming out lately is uh, teachable. Amen. Everybody say, I am teachable. Because the day you stop being teachable, you've become a know-it-all. And when you become a know-it-all, you become prideful. And it kind of lends itself into the message like this, where humility is lost in your life. And then when humility, humility is lost in your life, I can tell you right now, that's the foothold of the enemy. Say amen. Because humility is a, is a fine thing to exhibit. Humility is one of those things. You can't say you're humble. Hallelujah. People have to identify that for you. You cannot go around saying, I'm humble. You just exhibited pride. <laughs> Amen. Some of you are stunned by that because you probably told somebody you're humble this week. Anyway, let's, <laughs> let's be the church that does something so totally different than we've always done. Amen. I dare you to be different today. Amen. Some of you ladies change your hair color every week. You dare to be different. <laughs> Amen. Oh, let's not let those roots get out of control, ladies, okay? Because it looks like you're wearing a whisk broom on your head. All right, amen. All right, just say amen. Just love me no matter what, okay? You guys, you ladies got to work together on that, okay? If you see a little bit white, tell them. It's like having broccoli in your teeth. You pray somebody has the guts to tell you, amen? All right, good. True humility requires you to... If you can see from that side, I know I'm blocking the way. True humility requires you to submit to God's word and his plan for your life rather than your own words and plans. Everybody has a plan because we sometimes make these goals or whatever. We come up with these plans and say, I want to do this. I want to do that. If you ever sit with me, I'm always going to suggest that you do everything. Amen. You should leave no rock unturned in your life. Because you never want to get to the tail end of your life and say, I wish I did that. So I was always a person that dared to do the impossible. I had a father that used to tell me, why are you going to do that for? You cannot do that. You're not qualified to do that. So being rebellious, I would always do the opposite. And the only reason I'm in ministry today is when I first started this church, my father said, so how long is this going to be? So with that being said, we, April 15th, what is the date today? 21. Okay, six days ago, this church turned 18 years old. Hallelujah. We have officially reached adulthood. But we're still not legal, I guess. Well, we, we will never be legalistic as a church. Amen. That's not something we want to be. We want to be free. See, the day I get up here and I start lecturing you about your behavior is the day that I stop doing this church. Amen. Because I don't want to be that person that tells you how to live. Because you have free will. You should live your life the way you best see fit. And if you're not happy on any given day, hallelujah, ask somebody to pray for you. Or go to the doctor and get a prescription. Want something. Because right? you got to be, on Wednesday we talked about being joyful. How many of you were here? Let me see all eight hands. Okay. The God in you, even when you're not saying anything. You know what that means, right? You just got to be a person that is peaceful all the time. You're not out there looking for a fight. You're out here looking for Jesus to be exalted in the life of somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Remember, everybody doesn't read the Bible. They read you, though, especially when you say you go to church. They read you. Amen. So what kind of Bible are they reading? 
the gospel according to Batman. You're always mysterious. Always put it on a costume. And you cannot be a religious person. You got to be free in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. Trust him for everything you need. How many of you are trusting God in this season for everything you need? Amen. You know that a lot of you had a really, really rambunctious life. Hallelujah. And your pastor then he said, not me. I was quiet. <laughs> After coming up here and saying she's not robbing or stealing or murdering or stealing from the church offering. <laughs> I was listening to that. I was like, what? I've got to put on padlock on it. I've got to put on cover on this basket. <laughs> We've got, we got bills to pay. Amen. Well. The thing is, you cannot be somebody in one set of people and somebody else with another set of people. I mean, you got to be the same all the time. I know you got friends that drink and drug and smoke and whatever. But the thing is, if your presence in the, is there, how many know that your presence changes that atmosphere? You know, a church is a building, but you're a church walking around. You know, you might be the only Jesus that somebody meets on any given day. And you're over there saying, MF and Whatever, bro. You know what I mean? Calm down. Be a person of peace because people are looking for wisdom in this day and age. Am I right? You know, when you need guidance, you want somebody that's going to give you heavenly and godly advice. Not, not their opinion because you know what opinions, right? Everybody has. Okay. Anyway, opinions are like something. Okay. When you submit your will to God's will, you will experience lasting success, prosperity, and honor. Now, honor is not something you seek. Honor is something that people do for you as they, they see the Jesus in you, okay? And even if people honor you and lift you up, even now, you know, when they introduce me and I come up and you guys clap, I get all like, that's not, I'm not like that. And I'm a person that when you take my picture, I don't like that, you know, and <laughs> what? Anyway. <laughs> I'm not the person that, you know, I, I just don't like those things because I like doing my things. I, I like being a person that is there for you when nobody's looking. Amen. So I meet with a lot of you one-on-one -on -one or whatever, and I don't announce to the world, well, I'm meeting with so-and-so. You know, that's not who I am. Hallelujah. I just like getting results. All right. How many of you are the same way, right? Uh, when we're growing up, they would say, children should be seen and not heard. You guys remember that one? And as an adult, we all want to be seen and heard. Because our parents are not around to tell us that. That's pride. Amen. So we just got to calm your jets. Slow your roll. Pump your brakes. Whatever. Downshift in life. You know, everybody in here, we all need each other. Amen. A church doesn't exist except for people. And here's the thing. Churches are perfect places if there were no people involved. <laughs> uh, think church. Maybe we should call it crotch. Because we all got to lean on each other. What is, what is she, she thinking something totally different. And some of you lean on a crotch after, you know what I mean? No. Yeah, yeah. Better blow that out. All right. Humility. Read it. Humility means to comply with. What else? Obey and submit to God and his word and will for your life. Now, you all have a will that, man, you know, your will, on any given moment, it can give up. It can walk away. It can stop. But God's will, how I many you know that God doesn't change his mind, but God will change your direction? I want you to understand that God doesn't change his mind, but he will change your direction based on your face. I could say behavior. I could say, say actions, but how many know that God will not present your face to other people that need him if your face doesn't shine with the countenance of God? And some of you are wondering why you're just going through all this stuff all the time. It's because... Nobody like be around that face. It's not ugly. It just behaves that way. Now, you know, a countenance is a funny thing because your countenance tells a million things all at the same time. And, 
You know, for me, I, have, I always say this. I grew up in Lanakila. I had nothing to smile about. I worked, you know, my first job out of the shoot was I was a peer counselor for a drug treatment place. So this, this guy, he tapped me. He says, you'd be perfect for this job. I remember I was 15 years old. And he said, you're going to be perfect. All I need you to do is stay in this place, run all the recreational room. It was on Wailuku Drive. Run the rec room. And everybody that comes in, if they're having a bad day, you point them to us upstairs in the counseling. I was 15. I had to identify rotten faces from an early age. But I lived in Lanakila, so I had plenty of practice. So one thing I was, I was a great discerner of facial expressions. Plus, coupled with that was, uh, from a young age, I could see into a realm that I didn't quite understand. So I could see things, and I could see how they affected countenance. And I would just look at it and say, okay, you know what I found out? Almost everybody had to go upstairs. Yeah. And my job was just to make them happy, sell them soda, lift weights with them, play ping pong, shoot pool, counsel a little bit. And after that job, I, I got to, have, to work at the boys' club at the time to be another kind of counselor kind of thing. I was like, why do I qualify to be a counselor? And I asked the guy. Uh, he was from the mainland, Filipino, like Pastor Jeff, transplant. <laughs> Came back, and he was trying to, he, he had a hard time because he had uh, what he termed a howly way of talking. Uh, so I would have to be his pidgin English translator so that people could understand. And that job, again, was to counsel kids that were having a hard time. Just all of these things. Right after that job, I was a bag boy at Mall Foods right across the street, right in this parking lot, right across the road. And I used to get pinched and prodded by old ladies. So I had to check their face all the time. Because these Asian ladies, when they get older, they look at the long legs and they want to climb you. That's what one lady told me. She must have been 80-something years old. She said, oh, if I was 20 years younger, I would climb you. I was like, Grandma, are you Jack? Am I the beanstalk? <laughs> she was 80 years old. I said, 20, 20 years ago, Grandma, you're still 60-something. You still no can climb. <laughs> After that job, I went through a series of... Uh, interactions in my life, uh, uh, strange things started to happen to me. And then I became a preschool teacher for Head Start. Amen. How many of you are products of Head Start? And some of you wouldn't admit. Anyway, but from there, I did so well as a teacher that they moved me into the, a preschool called Hiile Daycare. And Hiile was for all of the sexually abused, physically abused, and mentally abused children. So I remember I was 18 years old. And they put me in this daycare center, and I would be a place where children would climb me all day because they could not get enough. They would just climb and hang on, and when it was time to go home, they would all cry and cry and cry. So even now, it still kind of gets to me because these children were sexually abused at two, three, four years old. So they, I would be that person, the countenance that I had, I guess. Yeah, I would laugh and play with them, and they liked that. They didn't have a male figure, or if they did, that male figure sexually abused them. So when, I, when it was time to leave that job, that was the hardest job I ever left in my whole life. But I couldn't survive on $2.85 an hour. You guys remember those days? I remember I got one raised to $3.15. I thought I hit the lottery. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, my take-home pay is $300 every two weeks. I was like, yes. I thought I hit the big time. And then I went to work for the state of Hawaii as a, as a corrections officer at Hilo Jail. And then I was another kind of countenance. So at every stop, you formulate these experiences. And people don't know the price of your anointing. All of you in this room, everything you went through in your life is important to God. Because he orchestrated that and migrated you through all of these things. And how many know that there's still a journey left ahead of you? Don't give up. Don't stop. Whatever is in your life now, value that because these are the experiences that will carry you through life. Amen? Some of you in your, in your teens, some of you in your 20s, 30s, some of you 40, 50, acting like you're 19 and 29. Praise the Lord. 
But it's all good experiences. But the one thing, the one common denominator that you have to exhibit is humility. Because humility will place you before presidents and kings and famous people and rich people. If you're a rotten, dirty scoundrel who doesn't believe you are worthy of anything, you will go nowhere in this life except home. You go home. Amen. I remember meeting one of the most famous people in the whole world. I was sitting in their presence. Uh, I was like, what makes this per- person more important than me, Lord? And you know what the Lord spoke to me? He said, nothing. I put you here. Because this person has no one to talk to. You know, there's people out there that are lonely. Value the relationships you have because the, sometimes they're in for a reason, sometimes for a season. Amen. If people are in your life for a reason, you need to value that and not start nitpicking that person to death because that person is valuable for your whole life. If they're in it for a season, I mean, you know, you still got to love them over there even when the season's over. Everybody has these experiences. Now, all of you in here have had people come in for a season. But even if they supposedly hurt you, you can't hate them because God put you there. Okay, God wanted you to learn something from that. Very valuable. Because you only get to the next level based on what you do on this level. So God moves you. And as you move through life, every person, let me ask you this. How many of you have people in your past that you cannot stand, you hate them, you wish they were dead? See, my hand is up first. Yeah, but then the reflection, self-reflection is, I wouldn't be who I am today without those people. On every stop. But you cannot get worse. You got to get better. Amen. Because all it's going to teach you is that somebody may come into your life in the future that will just knock you right down flat. Unless you have humility and you're already down low flat. Amen. Don't ever get prideful because if you're prideful, it can push you over anytime. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember I had this, this girl we grew up in Lanakila with. She would look at us, and she wasn't a very good-looking girl except to her mother because everybody's good-looking to their mother. (laughs) But this girl was always nice to her, and I would spend time with her, and she used to value that relationship. And then one day, these guys told me, hey, come with us. We got to go. We go over here, and we're going to play kickball. So we went and played kickball, and she was on the side, and I could see by her face she was not happy. She was mad at me for playing kickball. And afterward, we was walking. I said, hey, how come you never come play kickball? She goes, because I never like. <laughs> I was like, okay. Somebody woke up on the wrong side of the bed, probably under the bed. And we were walking down. Then all of a sudden, she just pushed my head really hard, cracked my neck. And, okay, crack. and I was like, what the heck was that for? She goes, because you left me by myself. I was like. We sixth grade, we're not married. <laughs> in her mind, she was in this tight relationship and nobody else could come in. And I was like, I just wanted to play kickball. You know, I have to broke my neck. <laughs> After that, I will always invite her. Here's the thing. I didn't invite her to play kickball. I just went with the pack and she got murdered. And this girl, I think her name was Butchie. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was close. It was real. <laughs> I think that was her nickname. But she was really mad at me. After that, I valued that relationship because at any given moment, she could broke my neck. <laughs> but one thing I learned from that is you need to look at people and fix the countenance. You need to fix because we're here as problem solvers. We're here as fixers. We're not here as breakers. Amen. Oh boy. Don't be the problem. All right. Because somebody going to come and solve it. by will push to your head and crack your neck. <laughs> and one thing I got from that was I was prideful in a way where I ignored her and I went with this and she got mad. I was like, after that, I was like, oh, brother, sister, brother, sister, I don't check you out. But I began to value that relationship. And then I met up with her a couple years ago, and I said, oh, remember that time you pushed my neck? I broke my neck almost. She goes, you deserved it. Now she's happily in a civil union with another, I guess, person, lady. 
And she told me, you know one thing I know, eh? She said, you're the only guy that would come and spend time with me. Because she was confused at the time with all of her stuff. And told her, I'm still here, sister, brother, sister. Because <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't attack anybody's lifestyle. It's your life, man. Live them how you like, amen. Yeah. Some of you like KTA. I like Safeway. We're all different, right? <laughs> Some of you know Kel. We ever get the deal. All right. Hallelujah. Value the relationship. Amen. Remember, every relationship is meant to be for a lifetime. Just some are seasonal, so they'll come in in different seasons. Others for reasons. Amen. How many of you got good friends, even in this room? How many of you never met a friend you didn't want to choke their neck and get rid of them, but they never leave? Some of you have kids like that. All right, Pastor Denise. All right. <laughs> God is good. Amen. This ain't no thing but a chicken wing on a string, they say. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Humility, again, means to comply with, obey, and submit to God and His Word and will for your life. We are to humble ourselves before God. If you're writing these scriptures down, you can go and check them out later. This is Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. Amen. You guys all writing these down on the back of your bulletin? You know, I work hard on those bulletins. Take me at least 14 million hours to do one. All right. All right. Verse 6 through 8. All right. Uh, it says here, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? This is the only thing, that, and even now, in the finished work of Christ, this is the only thing that God requires of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Can you get that? That even after the finished work of Christ, He just wants you to walk humbly with Him. Now, you, Adam walked humbly in the cool of the day with the Lord. You know what that means? He was firmly in a relationship with God. The one thing that separated man from God in the original intent in Genesis was pride. Amen. Because if you read, Eve looked at the tree and saw that it was good for food. That means that she lifted her countenance to a place where she shouldn't have. Off of God onto something else. So for you, just recalibrate your focus. Anytime you're lost, just ask God, God, am I doing good for you today? And that's it. He'll tell you in a heartbeat. He won't wait a long time. All of you, I don't care what you do, but you better check with God how you doing. All right. Everybody good with that? Close your eyes real fast and ask the Lord, Lord, am I doing good? Yeah. And let me give you the answer. Not just because you came church today, you doing good. <laughs> Because some of us think that we got to come here like a time clock and punch in. Or we come and say, hello, 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 hello. We're trying to get as many people to witness your presence. I showed up, hallelujah, and then go out and act the devil. Anyway, remember, you're here because you want to be here because you feel like God is going to download something to you. Now, just in this first 10 minutes or whatever, you probably got that God just wants you humble walking with him every day. Is that true? That's it. If you're going to be a person that wants to be this powerful, used vessel of God, all you got to do is be humble. God will take you wherever he needs you to be. And he'll, he'll put you before the most famous people. And some of them, the most infamous people. Right. I found myself on both ends of that yardstick. All right. So in your notes again, let's go there. Walking in humility means to be submissive and compliant. All you got to do is comply with what God wants. It's so easy, you know. Don't hate where you're at because you're only there temporarily. If you hate your job, here's good news for you. You're only going to stay there as long as you're grouchy. <laughs> Hello. 
Why? Because God doesn't want you to be grouchy. Once you graduate from grouchy college, he'll take you to Happyville. <laughs> For me, he take me to Happy Valley. Fried rice and uh, salt and pepper pork ribs. Anyway, <laughs> once you stop being grouchy, start being grateful, God will move you to another place. All right? Just because you're happy in a place doesn't mean that you belong there. There's the other side of that, right? Because you're there to accomplish God's will for that season. Some of you think that once you get one state or county job, that's it. Or you get in the union, you power already. I've got to work here 35 years. Well, maybe, but maybe not. All right. We all think about quitting every day. Amen. Depends on the day. Depends on who's in that day. Yeah. If it's dependent upon the people, it's because you're in the middle. I noticed it got very quiet at that point in the sermon. Um, people are reactive. So whatever you are portraying, I mean, you know, they react to you. So if you're a happy person, they either hate you or love you. But you just keep doing what you do. All right. Humility reduces the power of independence and ensures dependence on God. God just wants you to be dependent on him, not so that you're begging God to move in your life, but so that you realize your true identity so you can move with God in your life. Because life is a series of choices. How many of you have made a bunch of bad ones? Hallelujah. All right. As long as they don't tattoo your, their name on your Okay. Moving right along. If there are no more scars, right? You shouldn't have scars from somebody, names or T-shirts to prove. Okay. True success is fulfilling God's will for your life. So many of you today are, believe it or not, on the track. You're on the tracks again. Your, track, your train has not been derailed. He's put you back on the track. Here's good news. Don't derail yourself anymore. You don't have to. He'll send you down this journey. It should be smooth. All right. Success, all right? God isn't going to tell you to do something that's going to hurt you. You guys know that? God will never have you do something that's going to hurt you. And he'll also never have you do something that's going to hurt somebody else. Amen. All right, let's take a look. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And many of you have memorized this verse based on your grandma's teaching. Or somebody like that. They took you to church a long time ago. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So you know that God's plans always have future things, future success. That's why I say the journey is valuable because where you're at today is not your final destination. He always has somewhere and somebody and some place that you need to get to. All right? Some of you are transplants to Hilo. How many of you are transplanted to Hilo? All right. Hallelujah. Well, you can look at it, but... <laughs> That's the Denise. Anyway, here's the thing. Why are you here? Because oh, her husband made her. Uh, mine's too. It's either that or you said one time you came to him and said, oh, I'm tired of where I live. It's so hot. I love the rain. And we in Hilo live here a long time. We love the rain sometimes. Well, whatever reason you're here, I mean, you know, your journey has brought you here. What for? Why? What is your destination? What is your destiny? Amen. And why are you here affecting us? I'm just playing. Everybody is here for a reason. Amen. You know that when these people get transplanted from another place and they come in, they try and force the way they used to live here. I mean, it doesn't work very well. We start calling them all kind of names. The first word in the description starts with a PH. Some of you get that later, and it ain't Phyllis. All right. Well, the thing is, you know, you're here. Everybody gets along. We all migrate together. You know, Hilo is the most beautiful place on the planet. I've been all over the place, and I can tell you right now, I, I miss Hilo. As soon as I get off the airport, I see the security guard by the escalator. I want to go back and get on the plane and leave. 
Because there's this one lady, she's religious. I know her for a long time. She's a go to this church, and she's a security. And I look at her, I'm like, you make me want to leave Hilo. <laughs> she's the first person that greets us at the airport. When you get off the plane, you walk into his baggage claim. She's sitting over there with her happy face. I'm like, these are all the reasons why I go do ministry elsewhere. Because it is. Because I know what church she goes to. Now, I'm not judging her in a way. I'm judging her countenance. Because if you hate your job, please quit your job. <laughs> Amen. Then you come down the escalator and the visitor information guys all over there staring at you like. <laughs> what are you staring at? I'm not. I'm, I'm returning home. Can you imagine you're a visitor and you see that happy face? Again, it goes back to countenance, right? Gosh, if you hate your job, do something else. Amen. I know all of you, you know, if you get to the supermarket and you start looking for cash register and you start looking at the cashiers, many of you will stand in a longer line just so you don't need to deal with the face of who is over there. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. Don't be the face that people avoid. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Don't be the face, right? Check your countenance. Are you all right? Amen. How many of you are always smiling? Don't always smile and laugh to yourself. People think you're nuts. <laughs> okay, so you got to be even keeled. You know what I mean? You don't want your ship like tossing and turning and no more wind. Something wrong. All right? Be a person that's even keeled, like you're smooth sailing all the time. All right? Some of you, when you're not in the presence of people, they talk about you. Like, oh, my God. And then you come back, oh, how's it? Be careful when you come back into a group of people and they're happy to say, hey, yes, because uh, they were just talking about you. you know. Amen. You guys know what I'm talking about. Family is the number one thing, you know. I got family. How I many of you got family? As soon as one problematic person walks out of the room, everybody look at each other like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then they come back, oh, hey, yeah. So I was down over there, and I was doing the kind. And you side eye them. You all have family like that. Amen. Hallelujah. Or you standing behind them when they're talking, and their eyes are pretty much closed the way they talk with their head. Like, and then, you know, and, yeah, and you're behind. <laughs> Humility. Amen. You don't know the cost of somebody's anointing. You don't know why they're the way they are. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember this lady, she grew up really poor, her whole life poor. She married this very successful man. She was 30, he was 80. So she was punching time. You know what I mean? When he died, she inherited all the money and everything. And all of a sudden, she's like, well, you know what I think. I'm like, oh, my God, sister. I used to watch you sleeping in your car on Kaka Beach. And now you all that. Oh, come on. No. You one decision away from being in a nicer car sleeping down the beach again. Amen. People are like that. You guys know people like that, right? How many of you love those kind of people? Well, don't be one of those kind of people, amen? Just stay humble. Can you stay humble or are you going to go grumble? Watch out for the people who grumble because they're not humble. Always grumbling about something. I got to catch myself because I grumble about everything. Some days I think I'm Portuguese. My last name is Wa, not Waljin. You know what I mean? I know all the Waljins. <laughs> They're good people. I worked with a few of them. Every one of them had a different personality. Hallelujah. <laughs> Waj. Somebody in Portuguese guy told me, how you pronounce your last name? Waj. I was thinking to myself, Shut your mouth, you posh mod. Anyway, now I think I am Portuguese. What? Oh, good night. What am I doing? Uh, so I told my dad. My dad lived in Hawaii a long time. Once he met my mother, he liked that dark meat. So Thanksgiving, he always ate the drumsticks and the thighs. Anyway. <laughs> 
Well, he never went back, so I always used to tell him, I ah, qualify people. If, you, if you're a Caucasian person, you move to Hawaii, you live here more than 20 years, you just turn Portuguese. Because <laughs> your language starts changing to pidgin, and it's all busted up like somebody was talking earlier. But it's all good. Yeah, man. <laughs> Uh, okay, so God isn't going to tell you to do something that's going to hurt you. And most of all, he's not going to have you do something that's going to hurt others, right? Are you agreeable with that? All right. God's plans for you are designed to prosper you. Yeah. How many of you are prospering others? Well, you got to try and help other people, right? That's why you're here. You're not here to get all the help. Something wrong with you if you're trying to get all the help. You need to be a help to somebody. God will give you the desire to do what he has called you to do. So God installs these desires. And some of you, you don't know why you like certain things. Amen. There are certain kinds of people in this world. Some people like ake. How many of you like raw liver? How many of you like coke liver? You all need psychotherapy. (laughs) I don't like either. Amen. If I got to buy my meat in a container, something's wrong with that to me. Why is that in a poi bowl? Well, some people like that, and then some people don't like none of that. See, we're all created differently, right? And the Bible says we're all magnificently and wonderfully made. Sometimes I wonder. Amen. Ministry is a funny thing because you find out everybody's deepest, darkest things and how bad it is. And you got to be the strength for that person. So you cannot be a person that gets into counseling with somebody and you're a minister and they say, Oh, and I, I went through this and went through that. And you go like, so stupid, yeah, you. What kind of minister are you? If you're going to start picking them apart, you got to relax, right? You got to just be an absorber. You got to be a sponge. And then later on, you got to be able to squeeze the sponge of your life out so all of that comes out. Because you can't, you can't be dirty all the time carrying everybody's baggage. Amen. And here, God won't make you do something that will destroy you or that is unfulfilling. Because God wants you to be fulfilled in everything he's called you to do. Amen. He wants to validate you as a person. He wants you to be that strength for the weak person. All right. Do I, like for me, do I have weak moments in my life? Yes, I do. Evidently, it's starting to take a toll on me. So I got to really check myself. One thing I'm doing right now is I'm doing a lot of ministry. And I'm praying that as this healing anointing passes, it's going to take what I'm going through. right, And it's going to take it and go. Amen. That's what I'm believing God for. Uh, If I'm a person that says, oh, woe is me, and I become Eeyore, oh, woe is me. Oh, look, how many of you think Eeyore is cute? You know why? That makes you a minister. You want to fix Eeyore. (laughs) That's the truth. When you look at that, you want to fix it. Like, oh, I just want to hug him and help him. But if Eeyore don't smile at some point in time, you're going to be the next one, Eeyore part two. And then you're going to be holding each other, oh, woe is us. (laughs) And that's what some churches have become, the Eeyore club. Woe is me. Winnie the Pooh is all about, I'm just looking for honey. I'm telling you right now, Winnie the Pooh is the most successful single person in the history of the world because he can't find his honey. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Keeps sticking his head and getting stuck and then he pull out and no more honey. Goodbye. No more honey, no more money. It works both ways. No more money, no more honey. No more honey, no more money. Yeah, he's just... Life is a dream, they say, and you wake up in a nightmare. Anyway, all right. Well, all of us in here, we just got to realize what is God's plan for our life. You know that I said it earlier during the, the baby dedication that your gift will make room for you. You know that all of you are here with a gift, and it's not called gab. You forgot to explain the jokes. The jokes is not a joke. 
It's not the gift of gab, is what I'm trying to say. All of you have a gift. What is your gift? You know, during the renovation of this place, many of you exhibited your gifts. Amen. Some of you do stuff that I can't do. Amen. I like to think I can. That's why I play sidewalk superintendent. My finger is long and straight. And some of you thinking, take that finger off and shove it in your eye. <laughs> and then some people think, how come you're not helping us? Well, I would love to help you, but if I get in your way and we both bang heads, then you're not going to come to church anymore. Then you're going to blame me for getting in your way. Your gift will make room for you. What is your gift? Some of you believe, well, think of it this way. If your family believes your gift is making problems, that's not really a gift. That's not a good gift to have. Amen. All right. So what is your gift? Well, some of you can play music and sing worship. Some of you can pray for others. Some of you, your gift is to sit down and shut your mouth. And that's a great gift to have in a church sometimes until God equips you into your real calling to go do something. But needless to say, everybody has people in your life. Am I right or am I wrong? When you leave this building, are there people in your life? Or do you go back in the mountains to your cave and play Jesus? You need to get out amongst people, amen? Because God didn't put you here to be a loner and grow a long beard and try and forage through the forest for your food. He brought you here to be social, all right? How many of you are social? Some people called you a social butterfly. Some of you are social moths. You just destroy everything. You go around and eat them to death, amen? They walk away and they close all puka. I don't know what happened. They came. I don't know what happened. That happens sometimes. You know, people, Pastor, I just want to bless you. And, oh, I just love your ministry. And they have an envelope in their hand. It says, in their hand, it says, Pastor Tim. And I'm like, okay, I wonder what's in the envelope. One lady, one time, she gave me a gift certificate for $2 to KTA. That's a true story. This lady had money, too. And you know what she told me? I just wanted to give you this gift, and I pray it doesn't make you prideful, that you, you accept it in humility. And I was like, what the heck? I thought maybe $20 or something. I opened it, it was $2. I was like, okay, either she thinks we're living in 1947, or she's trying to teach me a lesson. And I looked at that, and I just said, what is the lesson here? And the Lord says, just smile and act like it's the greatest gift you ever got. I said, okay. I said, oh, thank you. $2. Well, I can almost get one bag of cookies. <laughs> I didn't say it. I thought it. And I said, oh, thank you. I gave her the biggest hug. I said, thank you so much. I know you were very thoughtful when you gave me this. And I was behind her ear. And the Lord says, now, now, tisk tisk. Just receive. I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. I just said, oh, thank you so much. I know you work hard for this. And I didn't say $2. I just said, you work hard for this. Thank you so much. And she says, oh, she said, God told me to give you that. I said, oh, that's good. Thank you. I accept anything. Amen. Except liver. I accept. <laughs> hey, you know what she did? She busted out another envelope for $500. said, oh, you're testing me, eh, Grandma? <laughs> You never just ice pick me in the kidney while you're at it from the back. Here, test this healing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Two dollars, then she gave me on five hundred dollars. I said, "Oh, thank you so much, but no need. I just keep this smaller one." Yeah, I did. I told her that. No, no, no need. I just take this one. I'm happy with this. She go, "Oh, you fishing for a bigger one?" Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm a comedian too, you know what I mean? Like, uh, so $502. So the church at the time, we 
through a big, uh, it was for Christmas, so we bought prime rib, and we bought all kinds. Yeah, man, prime rib. And you know what I learned from all of that? Don't give your church people prime rib, because somebody going to grumble. Because some like them well done, some like them medium, some people like you cannot please nobody, so I know one thing, spam and pork and beans. <laughs> nobody can grumble. Amen. To me, that is the greatest meal. Frank food, hot dog, Portuguese sausage, onion, spam, and pork and beans all together in one pot. Don't tell me you live in high on the hog if you ain't eating that. Because to me, that was the greatest meal you could ever conjure up as a kid. Amen. And you were proud of it. And then you put one scoop of mayonnaise on top with rice. Oh my God. Oh my God. So These mainland people don't know what it's like to live like that. That's the way to go. They call it pork and beans, but there's no pork in there. I don't know what they're talking about. Get one. That white blob, boys and girls. That gelatinous mess that slides so easily down your throat. That was the pork. <laughs> now, don't chew it. Savor it. Amen. Keep it for the flavor. She said, what flavor? I don't know. That looked like one big white something. I don't know. But it's all good in the hood, right? Yeah, it's all good. Amen. I remember when I was in paramedic school in Florida, I made char siu chicken and fried rice. Should have seen these white people looking like, why is the chicken red? Yeah. <laughs> I was big at the time. I said, because there's more for me at the end. Hallelujah. Until they tasted it, then all of a sudden, it was gone. I was like, oh, these guys stealing our goodness now. You know, one thing I did, though, is somebody mailed me a care package from Hawaii to Florida, and it had white rabbit. You guys know the white rabbit? The white rabbit was the, the candy you unwrap, and you get the rice pepper inside so you can. And, the, and I shared it with some of these whiter people than me. And they were trying to peel the pepper off. <laughs> I said, eat the paper. They're like, mm, what? You're tricking me, right? You're trying to kill me, right? You're trying to get rid of me. I'm like, no, you just suck it. It disappears. They could not believe until they did it. Then it was a novelty. And I was like, oh, my God. Now they want it. And so they were, hey, man, can your family mail one of these? I'll give you $10 for a bag. And I was like, $10 for one bag. But nobody would mail it. So I found myself in Chinatown. In Tampa, and I found the white rabbits. I bought them all, and I said, These are hard to come by. Gonna be 15. <laughs> and they would pay it just so they could show their friends, You can eat the paper, man. Yeah, and I had to stay humble. Yes, it's all good. Just go ahead. Yeah, I was struggling. I was a student. It was hard, man. And pork and beans is your friend without the, the hot dog or the Portuguese sausage. Yeah, and then you know they're struggling. But these guys would pay. And I, they would all show everybody, you can eat the paper, man. And I would just be, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. And then I could afford the hot dog. Life is life, man. You all got to make something out of it, right? How many of you ever had to wheel and deal? Huh? I mean, you had to lie, cheat, and steal, and we lend deal. How many of you still doing that? You need prayer. You better come up here. I was looking pray for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Trust that God's plan for your life is the best plan and will bring enjoyment. How many of you are enjoying your life right now? All of your hands should go up because if you're not enjoying it, either go on top of this building and jump off. Or change the way you live. Right? <laughs> All right. Now, don't jump off into the pool and say, oh, I tried. Yeah, right. 
All right. Be a person that is fulfilled. You know what that means? That whatever you're in at this moment is the greatest time of your life. Amen. How many of you are having the greatest time of your life? Yeah. You guys going to sing the Dirty Dancing theme song. You had the time of your life. <laughs> wow. Humility can be likened to an obedient child submitting to the plans of his or her parent. Amen. You know that when you do good for your parents, they reward you. How many of you got rewarded handsomely? You know what is the greatest reward for an obedient child? Is to not get cracks. Amen. We all learn that one. Just be good. You know, get licking. And when your siblings get licking, you go, <laughs> It's because you rotten. That's why. Yeah, when you're getting licking, nobody better look at you. Because you just stare them down. <laughs> you better not look at me. I'm going to lick you after they leave. Oh, obedient children, right? When you're born again, you are to become as a little child. That's Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4. Put yourself in a position to depend on God by be, being willing to do whatever. He says, ask yourself, what does it say? Am I depending on God for everything? Now, it's not depending where you're only living by what God says. Remember, you have free agency. You have free will. You depend on God wherever he migrates you to, right? So as you get to this spot, how do you know that God will provide for you? Provision is a funny thing because there's a lot of Christians never move out into their ministry of destiny because they're waiting for God to provide before they go. No. Every story in the Bible, me, it always had this hidden meaning where you had to move out to meet the provision of God. God will do it for you. A lot of you are saying, well, God, if you want me to have this job, then I'll apply, but it's up to you. How I many know that you got to apply first? You got to dare to have no fear and apply. Amen. I just had this conversation with my son on the wall because he hates his job. I said, you hate your job because it's your first job, son. Welcome to life. And he's like, oh, he's giving me the rack of frack, a rack of frack, you know, the, the Yosemite Sam. I said, wow, relax. Well, you're just here to learn something. You're going to the next place with this attitude. You're going to be on guard waiting for somebody to screw you over. And then what you're going to do? Now you're going to hate that job. Some of you go from relationship to relationship like that, and you wonder why. Hallelujah. Amen. Just tell them, give you all their bank account when they come into a relationship with you. Give me everything. I bet you they change their countenance right away. Oh, I better behave so I can get my toys back. Yeah. People are funny. You know, that the number one reason people get split up is because of money. The second one is because of past hurts. <gasps> Some of you walking around with a backpack full of stones. And they all have a name of somebody that hurt you in a backpack. And when somebody comes new in your life and you all of a sudden you're like, oh, hang on. You take off the backpack, you unzip, you start looking. You, are you like this one? <laughs> because what happens is you start identifying behavior with past hurt. Remember, your two demons in life are the ones from your past and the ones in your future. Either one is fear-based. Amen. We all have this. Even I do. Sometimes I get some people wanting to get close into my life. I start looking. Hang on. Go ahead. Make my day. <laughs> I'm going to smash your head with this old cannonball. You know the thing is? People are in your life for a reason. Some stay for a season. But everybody's in your life for a reason. You know, one of the greatest pains as a pastor is when people leave your church because of offense. You work so hard to get people in the seats, and then all of a sudden, one day, they don't come back. And you're like, what happened? And then you hear stories about why they never come back, and they start to identify. And all it is is they're identifying past hurts that they have, and they're blaming you. So I take that personal sometimes when they say, well, you know, Pastor Tim, you didn't even pay attention to me. But I arm you with a lot of weapons. 
You know, there's this one guy, he started a church, I won't say where, but he was here for a season, about three years. He calculated all the notes, and all of a sudden, instead of coming to me and just saying, Pastor, it's been wonderful. Thank you. God is calling me to another church. He took something. He turned it into an offense, and then he left without saying anything, went, started his ministry. I just got a call from him not too long ago. He says, God said I had to humble myself and come back and apologize for leaving because I had said all kind of rotten things about you when you were the one that built my foundation. I was like, who are you? Because this person, while he was in my ministry, wasn't very humble, was very prideful, thinking like, you know when they say, you're the kind no stink? Yeah, it ain't rosy, baby. This person always had a nitpicky thing. Right? So, you know, when he, this person left, I was almost happy they left. But then the rumors started coming back. Oh, you know him? He's doing this. He's doing that. He's stealing this. I was like, what? And then now he's in charge of a church. Let me just share this with you. And he found out what it's really like to be the lead person in a ministry full of problem people. Because he felt like, I'm called to the streets. Yeah, I'm not, amen? So he's now ministering to former street people. Oh, you know, that's a whole other realm because they have a lot of past hurts that you got to deal with. Their backpack resembles a dump truck. Yes. <laughs> amen? And they're not going to take one stone and smash you in the head. They're going to try and put you on the back end when they... Doot, 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 and then drive away. With you in the back of the truck. They're going to reload the truck and throw your dead carcass in it too. Yeah. And so he's finding out now that it ain't all grand to be a leader. Amen. Remember, if you're a leader, you got to be the example people follow. I'm not the greatest example to follow. I am amazed that people ask me for marital counseling. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I went through a divorce. He asked me, how do I fix my marriage? <laughs> um, <laughs> sign on the bottom. <laughs> 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 but here's the truth. I do have a lot of experience. Amen. The mistakes I made become good advice for you not to make the same mistake. Amen. So I am valuable to a certain extent, but in, when it all is said and done, like they say, at the end of the day. People always tell me, you're a pastor. Why did you get divorced? I said, I didn't do it. She did it to me. Hallelujah. I was the defendant. You know that means? I got it filed on me. I just said, Ow. Because when you see the bank account going, when you cannot make your car payment and your lawyer driving on Lexus, did I pay for that? The only winners is the lawyers, guys. Yeah. Some people lose more than others. Eh, Amen. I lost a ton. A ton. People tell me, we get 10000 in bills and 400 in the check-in. I don't like, I like all. For me, add five more zeros to your 400 and we get a chance, you know. So again, I am amazed when people ask me for advice in things I failed in. Hey, man, it's like, tell me, huh, how do I run the 100-meter dash faster? Unless you're on buffet at the end of it, I can't give you good advice. <laughs> and I was 350 pounds at one time, man. Um, I know some of you in here, you're bigger than me. You beat me to that buffet, bro. You throw me out of the way. I scurb on my face. It's like, you know, just if you're a person that doesn't know how to give advice, refer them to somebody. Don't be that prideful person that tries to be the problem solver for everybody because... I can't tell you how to stay out of jail. I can tell you how to work at the jail. These guys can tell you how to stay out of jail. We all have a gift, baby. <laughs> See, he pointed to his head, right? 
Mount Lagrimus. And so people come to me for drug counseling. I'm like, you got me on that one because I never did drugs. Huh? I smoked a little weed way back then, but I didn't inhale. Yeah. <laughs> you know the real reason I didn't get addicted to weed? Because I had ADHD, sort of. This was the worst thing I could think of. I want to go do that. I want, I can't, can, though my leg is not working. <laughs> Neither is my brain at that point, right? Well, I know some great weed smokers. These guys have the greatest ideas in the world. But they don't want to do it. Because all I can do is stare at that lay sour cream and onion on the shelf. And that fruity pebbles. Uh, uh. How is it you smoke weed? All you like to do is eat cereal. And you, uh, here's another thing. You all have your favorite cereal. Am I right? Am I wrong? Some of you may disagree, but to me, the greatest cereal in the world is life. Some of you need to get a life. <laughs> I heard one person grumble with me and say, The thing gets soggy too fast. <laughs> Bruh, <laughs> calm down. How fast do you want to eat that? <laughs> yeah, you got to know that you're a cereal connoisseur when you want to try all of them. Because I was at the Holiday Inn Express in Queens, in New York, last week or a week and a half ago. And they had this carousel of four different flavors of cereal. And I was like, I wonder what it would taste like to try all of them at the same time. Then I put the milk and I'm like, brah. Corn, it was Frosted Flakes, Raisin Bran, Special K with Strawberries, and Fruit Loops. Four great tastes that don't go great together. And you know what I, I noticed one time? Well, after I had, the first morning I did that, and I was like, okay, I, I did special K with strawberries, and I did Frosted Flakes. I'm like, you know, that was pretty good. I was like, okay. About two hours in, I was like, mm, mm, too much fiber. Mm. <laughs> I said, don't do that again. The next day I was doing it again. About one hour in this time. And then I had to go. That was it. I saw the flounder, the fishing pole, the rubber tire. The old hub from the truck. I was like, I can't do that anymore if you're going to preach and do ministry. Because you cannot be, hallelujah, praise you. Oh, and you start sweating in 30 degree weather. Uh, you got to be smart in this life. Amen. It's the act anointing. <laughs> it's the fake anointing. Uh, I was like, you're going to be fast. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, I'll be right back. Were you healed? Praise God. What scripture is this now? Yeah. She's trying to throw off my stories a lot. Some of you come just for the stories, not even that. No, I don't even lie. Uh, I had, I had a, this young lady in the mainland who's a spiritual daughter. She said, you have some of the funniest stories I ever heard, and I don't understand half of it. I was like, okay, man, you're spiritual then. you <laughs> getting true. All right. Hallelujah. When you're born again, you're to become as a little child. Put yourself in a position that might depend on God for everything. Humility will make you great. Now we can look at the scripture, verse 4 in Matthew 18. Oh, what is that? Matthew 18, right? Okay. Matthew 18. Change my font over there. Oh, I got to look at mine's one. Okay. Now you can go to the scripture. All right. Verse 3 and 4, right? Now if you go to verse 1. 
come down a little so we can read verse 1. Because somebody was asking Jesus the question. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But notice that the kingdom of heaven is not capitalized. So it's not talking about a place. They are referring to a place, but Jesus never refers to the kingdom of heaven as a place. Because he says this. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he's talking about a mindset. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. What he's saying is, you got to become childlike in your faith. That means humble. Because children are humble. You don't see children walking around. Well, you saw my new car that I get. Oh. <laughs> you saw how much money I get in a bank. And kids don't care. It's a lot. You know, kids, I tell you right now, the best place that children enjoy is climbing furniture. And sprinting around in a room with carpet, like rolling around on a carpet with no aim. <laughs> Kids are like drunken midgets. Come on now. Now you're all thinking now. Close your eyes and envision a little child. The greatest thing they do is run fast to no place, climb something as high as they can, and jump off with no fear. And when they land wrong, ah, ah, good for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go one more time. You cannot tell the kids, go, go, come on, one more time, and then yell at them for doing it. Which one is it? Kids are like drunk midgets. They just run, 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 climb and jump. And then you're looking at them like, oh, my God. Well, Jesus said that's the way to be. Hallelujah. Why? Because you got to have no fear in this life. You know that the number one killer of any ministry is fear? Why? Because the fear of the unknown. I don't know if I can. You know, I was like you guys. I would go up before uh, speech class. You guys remember you had to do your project or your presentation in elementary. And you get up here and it's like, dun, 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 dun. Then you're up here and you know, can blink all of a sudden. <laughs> you don't know what to say. Your thoughts escape you. You, you don't blink so long you start tearing. And everybody's like, look, oh, look, cry, baby. Eh, eh. Until it's their turn, right? I remember this. It, it was just like that. Or oh, you'd stare and then see spots happening, like darkness closing in on you. And I'll tell myself, oh, my God. I tell this story. I went to UH Hilo. I took speech from Dr. Mira. I used to work with his wife, so we were all cool. I used to play golf with him. We was all cool, right? Until speech class, and he says, okay, Tim Waugh, get up there. And just tell us what you got. And I was like, dun, 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 dun. So I started doing one of these things. Yeah, and then after that, I was over there, and then I started doing this thing. Uh, and, you know, I got an F for rocking the podium. I was like, brah. He, I knew him. I was like, brah, you give me an F. He go, yeah, because you broke every rule about public speaking. I was like, I broke every rule? He said, yep. You are rocking the podium. You are spinning the podium. You wasn't making eye contact. You wasn't identifying. Your subject was all over the place. And I was like, brah, look me in the eye. Are you serious? And he said, yeah, no, I'm serious. I said, brah. I said, you know that local people is nervous by nature. We don't trust nobody staring at us. Because we always say, what? Get eye problem. <laughs> he said, yeah, but you're giving a presentation. They want to hear what you have to say. So I was like, oh, my God. So I had second chance, second chance, I got up there. All of a sudden, I was not, I was catching myself, like, 
Yeah, and he said, he gave me a C. I'm going to see you outside. <laughs> he said, because now you're too stiff, too robot. I'm like, bro, what do you like? Finally, it came out. He said, when you get up there, just be yourself. Stop trying to be somebody else. Stop trying to emulate someone. Just be yourself. So you're looking at the final product of being myself. And I hated that. I was like, in the final grade, he gave me on C based on my book work. I was like, what? Because you know that in speech class? Sp- speech is only a small percentage. The rest of it is quizzes. I told him, what kind of Lolo did your mother raise? <laughs> He's like, well, what do you mean? I said, it's called speech class. And you're grading us on quizzes and tests? I say, like, brah. I told him, I never go and speak in public. I just doing this class because I got to get the credit for him. And you know what he told me one day? He said, one day you understand why I said all those things. Because you have great potential. I was like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> and then I started to speak in front of people. I was like, oh my God. I look at all the other Lolos in speech class, all professional. They sit behind one desk and punch computer all day. They don't talk in front of nobody. I remember one time I went to Detroit, Michigan. I told this story before. They picked me up at the hotel in a limousine. I was like, a limousine? Woo, hallelujah. I'm somebody. Picked me up. We went to this dilapidated part of town. I was like, oh, my God, for real? He's like, oh, well, in a limousine. Pull up to this building. The guy says, just go up the stairs. Somebody will greet you inside. I went up inside. I was like, oh, he's wearing an earpiece. Like, oh, secret service. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Then he took me to a room, and there were some leaders there. I got to talk to them. There was a green room. He had fruits and all these things. I was like, okay, this is interesting. This is an old beat-up building. I guess this is like a Bible study kind of thing. I'm like, I'm cool with whatever because I don't usually check the size of a church before I go there. And then this guy comes in, Pastor Tim, we're ready for you. I'm like, oh, huh? For a Bible study kind of thing? He leads me out, open the door. It's a stage, big as this room. And there's 10,000 people, or eight, I think they said eight to 10,000 people staring at me. <laughs> what? You guys get eye problem. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, they're all staring. Like, you know, kind of silence, you can cue them of cookie frogs and crickets. I was like, oh my God. Then they turn on this spotlight. <laughs> and this is a theater now, it's huge. They brought me in the back end of a theater that could seat that many people. I was like, so what do you say now? Because now you cannot remember your notes. I just started staring into a light and started telling stories about religious people. In my experiences with religious people, the place was crazy. They started cracking up and laughing and going nuts. And then all of a sudden, I said, right, stand up, let's pray. I was like, I don't know. I thought to myself, I was talking for only 10 minutes. They said I went an hour and a half. It was the funniest things they had ever heard because I was just identifying people and they were like pushing each other and it was kind of a black church. They were like cracking up and I th- over 24 or 2,500 people got healed of something in there. And I was like, I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> Hallelujah. I told this story about being in Santanella one time. I was praying for this lady. She was a big lady. And she, her story was, and some of you heard this story. Just bear with me for the new ones. But this lady was big. And I, can't, and I was giving a word of knowledge. Because you guys know at the end of service, I give a word of knowledge. It's very accurate because I don't remember what I said. I came to this lady and I put my hand on her stomach. I was like, whoa. And then my, my hand just started to shake. And I told her, the Lord says to tell you, you need to take your pride down. And she was like, I could feel her pushing. You know when they get mad, they start pushing forward like... My own praise the Lord. She, and I could hear her mumbling. <laughs> you know, like 
people you're trying to sell Lao Lao tickets to. <laughs> I was like, whoa. But afterward, because we're in a hotel in Santanella, a Ramada Inn. So I'm staying in a hotel. The, the conference is right across the yard. And I would go out and I would be talking story with people. I could see her in the courtyard. Like, oh, wait. I'm like, oh, my God. What's her deal? Then I come back for the afternoon session. She said, can I talk to you? Yeah, I guess. I guess I have no choice. Is that a loaded question? I don't, I don't think I can say no. She said, you know that I'm a self-made woman. Everything I have, I worked hard for. I did all this. Who are you to tell me to take my pride down? I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, I think I'm going to skip the afternoon session. Because <laughs> it's all prophetic in the afternoon. So she went in, and I was like, okay, I don't remember what I say. I just, I'm just the messenger. Don't kill the messenger. It's not my fault. And she went, and she had an afternoon encounter, and some other people told her similar things. When I came back that night, and I started to minister, I could see she was changed. Her countenance was changed. I was like, it's a miracle. Somebody else reached her. They harpooned her or something with Jesus, of course. And then afterward, I'm doing an altar call again. And then she, she, they ask, does anybody have a testimony? And she says, please, me. And she's going, <laughs> you know, when they get the Holy Ghost quiver. <laughs> she gets on the mic and she says, Pastor Tim came up and he said, and I refused that word. And I come to find out it is true. I have pride. And she said, Pastor Tim, will you do, the, do me the honor and pray for me, please? I'm humble. Please, I need to get healed of some things going on. I said, oh, okay. So I said, Come on. I'm, I told her, I'm sorry, maybe the way I delivered. She said, no, 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 it wasn't you. It was me. I'm, I had a lot of pride. I just want you to pray for me. I put my hand on her stomach, and my middle finger found her pico. <laughs> oh, that's one big third eye. And as soon as I put my hand on her pico, she did one of these sounds came out of her. <laughs> and then we kept going. <laughs> I put my I took my finger out and it stopped. I was like And the Lord said, put your hand back. Now, there's two catchers behind her because she's a rather large woman. And I was like, sorry, guys. (laughs) Put my hand back. (laughs) It went for a while. And these two guys over there trying to hold their breath. And and then they turned to the side. (gasps) 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 (sighs) And I'm just praying for her. And then all of a sudden, she falls. (laughs) And she, she's like, oh, and then I'm like, oh, my God. And everybody there was like, oh, my God. And then the two catchers were like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then she gets up, and her pants fall down to the ground, like straight to the floor. And she's just standing there rocking, and these ladies are trying to help her with her pants. Because, you know, when you get to that size, no more zipper, no more button. You just, you just at that point where, ah, ladies already. I prayed for her, and she, she had gotten skinnier. And I was like, oh, my God. She had to hold her pants. Like. And she's like, oh, my God. She says, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I'm like, don't put your finger in your pickle. <laughs> she's holding her pants for dear life. And afterwards, she's walking around, and her pants are, like, huge. You can fit on Volkswagen in there with her now. She got skinny. And she says, oh, my God, I had a 64-pound tumor in my stomach, and it's not there anymore. So evidently, pride can be linked up to some tumor in your life. Some of you, your tumor is on your shoulders. The whole thing is on big tumor. But that was her testimony after that. I was like, what? And she was running around the church holding her pants. Oh, my God, praise the Lord. 
Because she was a rather skinny person, except for this one part over here was big. And evidently, the Lord delivered her of a 64-pound tumor in the meeting. And she was praising God, and the two catchers were praising God in a way. <laughs> but that was the thing. And in that meeting, because of that, I'm not saying that that air coming out healed everybody, but everybody got healed. So here's good news for all you. Take a deep breath. Anyway, well, everybody got healed of something that day. It was amazing. Oh, you know that pride sometimes will fix others around you as it gets delivered from you. Everybody else gets healed too. Yeah, so don't be prideful. You know, I've met some people that they're very arrogant Christians. Well, praise God. I believe. And they will tell people, believe God for your healing. You need to trust God. And then they get sick. And, oh, my God. And then other people are like, yeah, trust God. No, I don't believe God. Don't be that kind of Christian that can't escape. You know, you got to be a person that is humble because you don't know what caused whatever they're going through. You don't know the pain and hurts, right? I got a lot of pain and hurt, evidently. You know, doctors say I'm going through something. But here's the good news. We're all going through it together. We all got to prop each other up. Amen? Now, these notes, you know, we can read all of this. Is it helping you, though? Yeah? Or is the stories helping you? Yeah. Boat. You know, in Hawaii, we cannot pronounce T-H. Boat. Ship or boat? <laughs> Just say the word with in, in local. With. We cannot say other because it has T-H. Ara. Cannot say the. Da. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just thought I'd point that out to you. Anyway. Because I catch myself sometimes listening to myself preach. Sometimes they put, about, put it up online and I'm like, oh my God, I cannot pronounce T-H. <laughs> I need to be delivered. <laughs> That'll keep you humble. Public speaking in front of thousands of people and you cannot pronounce T-H. Da. With the guys. With the guys. With the. Okay. It's not even guys at the end of that sentence. I drive speech and English teachers crazy because they come up to me after I speak in a church. Again. You know, I'm trying to get what you're trying to say, but it was like a run-on. Sister, I'm not writing one paper. <laughs> That's when the pigeon really come out. Yeah. So we, we're humble people, amen. Local people, for the most part, are humble people until you give us one tax return. And... <laughs> Try, try having to pay the IRS. Have a local person that have to pay taxes. Oh, my God. They, like, kill everybody. I hate Uncle Sam. I hate, I burn the government down. The government is the root of all the problems. But if they get a tax return from Uncle Sam, well, hallelujah. Praise God. I'm all good. Wow. Anyway. Okay. Humility will make you great. Don't let your years of experience as a Christian keep you from being humble. That's in 1 Kings 3, 7. You are nothing without God. God wants to be your very present help in times of trouble. Humble yourself the way Jesus did. Read these. It's all just informational. The way up is down. You know what that means? Humble yourself. You can look humble. How I many of you know people who act humble, but you know behind? Let me just pull your mask. Right in your face. False humility is an outward display without real submission to God. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Being religious is, read it. You guys can see. Being religious is false humility. You know what false humility is? The people who tell you they're humble. The ones you like smash them like a cockroach. You know, local people, you can learn a lot from a local person. Just watch how they react when a cockroach shows up. Amen. You know what I mean? Some people are hunters. Some are runners. Yeah. How about mosquitoes flying in your room when you hear that? 
How many of you love that song? What do you do? What is the first thing you do? Gun fun it. <laughs> you turn on the light and start hunting. Yeah. Mosquitoes are a funny thing. You will hunt them down. All right. True Bible humility can't always be seen. It's on the inside and comes from your heart. That's the truth of the matter. True humility is demonstrated by understanding your identity at the feet of Jesus. When Jesus fed the 4,000, there were many of the multitudes who were lame, blind, and had all types of sickness. They would kneel down at Jesus' feet to be healed. You can look that up in Matthew 15, right? All right. Next one. Slide. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jairus, all right? Jairus' daughter was healed when he fell down and submitted himself at Jesus' feet. Does that make sense to you? Mark 5. Because of her faith, a young woman's, uh, woman's young daughter was healed of demonic oppression when the woman cast herself down at Jesus' feet. Mark 7. A woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She anointed his feet with precious oil. Jesus forgave her of her sin in Luke 7. You guys see all the feet stuff? A man was delivered of demons at Jesus' feet, Luke 8, 35. Martha's sister Mary sat at the feet of Jesus to hear the word, Luke 10. All right? Jesus raised Mary's brother Lazarus from the dead after she fell down at Jesus' feet in John 11. You guys catching this now? It's about how low you go. John received a supernatural vision of end-time events after he fell at the feet of Jesus. All right, so a lot of people ask me about end times. This revelation, all of that pretty much, remember, John was the disciple Jesus loved, right? He was the one that he dug out. So he got a revelation of what was going on, where Jesus guys were, okay? So he was away, okay? So some people are still living like, it's coming, it's coming. Just live your life like you love life today. Can't succeed by yourself. Nothing will ever go right without knowing our identity in Jesus. It's not too late to acknowledge Jesus and he'll lift you up in your mindset. Let him do it though. Thirst and hunger for God and his plan. And his plan is what you need to advance spiritually. Your intelligence and ability shouldn't be exalted over your relationship with God. It doesn't matter because some of us, we watch Christian TV. We think those guys are the smartest guys in the world. No, they just got people in their church that can pay for them to be on TV. Evidently, some of you better work on your game so I can get on TV. I'm just playing. If I get on TV, I'll be the most, oh, my God, I can't even look at myself. <laughs> oh my God. It's just me. Amen. Some preachers love how they look. Oh, praise God, look at me. Like, no way. Ah, the, if I'm not comfortable in the clothes, how to be on TV with rubber slipper? Shorts and one shirt. It looked like you just went beach in Puleho. Yeah. From Hawaii, your intelligence and abilities, again, shouldn't be exalted over your relationship. Freedom comes from knowing you don't have to play political games to get ahead in life. God has a better way for you to be exalted. Your way may be the faster way, but God's way is the surer way. <laughs> Amen. Two reasons. Out of many to humble yourself are these two, right? So that God will lift you up for others to see, James 4.10. Or another reason, so that you can know God's grace in your life. You got to know God's grace. God has forgiven you. Don't believe other Christians that tell you you need to ask for forgiveness every day. Right? Why? Because how many know that God already knows you messed up? Right? How many know that you messed up? There's the problem. If you don't know you messed up, Mm -hmm. Everybody in here, you have reason every day not to go do something for God because you think you're not there or you're not worthy or you're messed up. Hey, if that's the case, we all might as well just go home to be with God already. Yeah. Let's all just be these people. In spite of whatever I do, I still love God and I'm still willing to help other people. All right. Stand up. 